el sector privado y la mirada externa, cómo nos ven desde el mundo. Esos son los cuatro talleres para que ustedes seleccionen el que prefieran y todo lo que quisieron decir durante la mañana y gente como yo no les permitió, lo van a poder decir ahí en los talleres. So we'll let us start. I should start by uh, uh, bringing to memory that famous phrase by Mark Twain that everybody talks about the weather but nobody does anything about it. No? You might remember. Well, everybody's talking about nearshoring in Mexico and right now there's plenty of uh, meetings and, and uh, seminars and so on and so forth. But basically what we found through the Aspen Institute is nobody's doing anything about it. Neither the government or the private sector have come up with a national strategy on this matter. So I, this is the, the, the thrust of this exercise today. And um, I'd like to start by exploring with you guys, uh, how do you see it uh, in, in geopolitical terms right now? I mean, and, and actually today is a very interesting day to have this conversation because yesterday in San Francisco, the presidents of China and the United States have apparently a very good conversation. Uh, I don't know whether that's signing peace or not, but we will see. I mean, it's, it's promising at least that they said we are going to move from conflict to competition or avoid competition and, uh, sorry, avoid conflict and, and think on our relationship in terms of competition. So, Everett, what do you think are the main elements that we should have as part of a strategy to make sure that North America continues to be the most uh, dynamic economic region of the world? And obviously, nearshoring is at the heart of it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just want to thank the Aspen Institute and the university for allowing me to be here with this distinguished group. It's really, I learned a lot this morning, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to contribute to that conversation today. I think it's really important to put the whole idea of nearshoring in context because it's not something, it's an ongoing process, it's not a, a, a something you can just point and go, okay, we're done, we nearshored, it's over. And in my, when I think back on the history of the U.S.-Canada-Mexico relationship, it has evolved and changed over time and adapted to all the external dynamics surrounding it. And the NAFTA was a reflection of what was going on at the time. It was a neoliberal uh, idea. It was a lot about integration, just-in-time uh, supply chains, and it worked really, really well in many ways. Yes. It wasn't perfect, but it worked really well. Now we've got really a seismic shift in uh, the global world order that is uh, unprecedented probably in most of our lifetime, and we're not sure exactly how it's going to resolve itself, so we have to deal with this ambiguity about where the world's going. We know a number of things. We know that the geopolitical tension between China and the United States is going to exist. We know that companies are very concerned about um, security and resilient supply chains. Um, we know that labor environment issues are going to continue to be at the top of the list of important issues for um, companies. And in fact, there was a recent study that came out that showed, this was by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, that showed the geopolitical risk was one of the most cited risk factors by companies when they went up to the S&P when they're doing their SEC filings. So I think what this tells us is that we have an opportunity here, but we're at the beginning of the opportunity. With the recent agreement between the United States, Mexico, and Canada, it lays a foundation for us to build on, but it is not enough. So some of the areas that I think can be complementary to that have been addressed today. We obviously, we talked about energy policy, we talked about workforce. Where one dynamic that's definitely happening is that the interdependence of the world is not going away, but the technology challenges based around national security are. So, when you look at nearshoring and you look at the topics that people are thinking about, like critical minerals, AI, semiconductors, they're all very high-tech, high-value added products. So that's what we need to think about, is how do we move up the value chain as a region to provide incentives for business to invest in this region and take advantage of that? Workforce, absolutely. You've got to have the service infrastructure to be able to do it. One thing that wasn't mentioned, um, we talked a little about physical security, but I would also mention cybersecurity, data, the ability to process data. And these tech industries are very, very heavily um, 
energy dependent, so you've got to have secure energy resources. So I, I appreciate what Arjun said earlier about identifying those areas where you could really have an impact. I would look at the high tech sectors and, and, and start with there with maybe some of the incubators that he, he had talked about as well. Luis, your perspective, please. Uh, what is prompting companies or industries to move around? What are the main elements? What are the, the propellers, say, of, uh, of having a company that is already based in Shanghai to go to Tijuana? What are the elements that are behind it? Maybe we have to understand that in order to make sure that we can have a strategy on this issue, right? Yeah, well, uh, um, thank you, uh, Enrique, for the invitation. Glad to be with you here. Uh, thanks to the Aspen Institute, to the Universidad uh, de la Libertad. I'm very happy to be sharing this panel with Everett Tysonstadt. I mean, Everett, uh, North America is in debt with Everett because he's one of the architects of the North American integration. And uh, uh, we really appreciate what you did in the US government on uh, different roles that you played, Everett. And uh, Mexico is uh, greatly uh, in debt with you. Um, <clears throat> the, I mean, I think we have to distinguish between decoupling and diversification. I mean, this idea that there will be a, a decoupling from China, from Asia, is absolutely false. It will not happen. I mean, I don't subscribe to the Thucydides' uh, hypothesis that uh, China and the US will have a war. And I think that's why the meeting in, uh, in San Francisco yesterday and today uh, is important. It is, yeah. I mean, because we need to engage China, and I think Mexico, the US, and Canada, and others have to engage China by uh, relaunching the multilateral system, including WTO. Is politically incorrect to say these things in Washington, but it's important we say them. Because, I mean, decoupling from China completely, one, is not realistic, it will not happen, it's counterproductive, but that doesn't mean that there will not be a, a significant diversification away from China. Uh, firms take a portfolio decision. I mean, it's, uh, as if you invest in shares in Wall Street, I mean, you will have a diversified portfolio, no? bonds, and then you have some shares of sectors that are high tech, other sectors that are more uh, raw materials, other sectors, other firms that are more in the consumer goods segment, etc. When, when you have a, 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 an imprint of manufacturing around the world, uh, you will try to strike a balance in terms of diversifi diver diversifying your sources of risk. And in the last 30 years, the large manufacturing companies have invested maybe 70% of their capex in China. And that's too high. Too high not only in terms of economics, but also it's too high in terms of geopolitics. And it's too high in terms of the, the deep transformation of the Chinese economy. I mean, Enrique and I and also uh, we participated in uh, what I will call the three previous Mexico moments. Uh, some others here in the uh, Armando and uh, Pancho and others as well. Uh, the first one was, of course, the NAFTA negotiation. As Everett said, it was momentous, very important. Then we had Mexico becoming a more democratic country with the election of President Fox in the year 2000. And then we had the structural reforms in 2013, 2014, which meant Mexico is maybe willing to take on something that is difficult, like, like energy. No? This fourth moment, the near sharing, is larger and is more important. Uh, it, uh, and it is larger because it comes from overseas, is structural, and has a, a tremendous potential to, to be a catalyst for uh, transforming the Mexican economy and North American economy if we do things right. And, and, and the, the question is whether uh, we are willing to do things right. And you were saying, are we doing something? Well, the president went to San Francisco. No? Maybe it's a little late. I mean, he, should, he, should, he, he should have gone to G20 in Osaka uh, in 2019. But I mean, going to San Francisco in the fifth or the sixth year of his government uh, appears to be a step in the right direction. Well, maybe because, maybe because the, the most difficult year for a Mexican president is the seventh, normally. No? <laughs> so. 
this about time to start sowing the, 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 the grass here. Covering all bases, yeah. Covering all bases, yeah. <laughs> As we speak now, uh, the perfect marriage has unfolded. Mexico is the single largest uh, uh, trading partner of the United States, and the United States is the largest uh, trading partner of Mexico. So in a way, the, the, the most cherished scenario already happened. But it's funny that even though we have this bulk, this huge bulk of trade between our two countries, there's no common strategy almost on nothing. I mean, we have been, the three of us, North American enthusiasts, right? There's, no, there's obviously no consciousness of being North American. No? Maybe the Canadians, because they are just further north, and that's about it. But uh, how can we uh, organize at least a debate on whether and, and what issues should be of interest for the three of us working together? And maybe China is a good helper in this. But I leave it to you, Everett. Well, I think you're certainly right that North American identity is not. Is not, there. not defined. And even you talk to the Canadians and they'll make it very clear they're from Canada, they're not from the United States, and uh, that's, you know, appropriate. And, uh, but at the same time, we're all very much dependent upon one another. And our futures and um, well-being matter because if one goes up, the other goes. And we cannot take this stability we have for granted. I mean, there is a lot of volatility in the world right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, sovereign debt out there. There's a lot of things we just saw, you know, horrific um, conflict erupt in the Middle East that wasn't expected. So I think that the, and I think Louise will agree with this, one of the very most important things we have are all these little institutions and conversations that don't matter or don't appear to matter, whether it be between the Department of Labor and your Department of Labor or the environment, but building those relationships among uh, high-level government officials and the private sector. So when you have a crisis, you know who to talk to and you have an, a basic understanding of each other and your needs. Because if we don't do that, then the relationship will atrophy. And we can't allow it to atrophy. So even though, and I'm saying this just as my opinion, I, I, the political window right now for a, a massive nearshoring initiative among the three countries isn't there, but it could come. And it could come in a year and it could come in two years. It could come in three years. But we have to lay the groundwork today to be ready. And that means this kind of dialogue in the dialogues among like-minded partners in our respective countries. So the university work, the academic work, it's, it's all very, very important. And there's a lot of uh, elements of the USMCA that are innovative that provide those forums. There's gonna be a review of the USMCA in 2026 and some of those forums have not been very robustly utilized, such as the environment. Some have been used a lot, such as the labor rapid response mechanism. Um, but there's going to be a, a perspective about, well, is this working or should we do something different? So I think the only, what I would suggest is that each of us, and I try to do this, you know, take responsibility for helping to drive that dialogue amongst our, our colleagues and, and create that continued conversation because with, without it, uh, we won't get to where we need to be when the time is right. So we normally respond, I mean, not only in Mexico, the U.S., but societies in general respond more to threats in general than incentives. Uh, fear is a big driver of change in general in life. And uh, I, I'm just going to knock on wood here, but maybe if this uh, war in, in the Middle East spills over, could actually uh, create havoc in many, many parts of the world, including ours, especially the U.S. as a target, right? We lived through this in, in 2001, 9-11. Uh, but I, I was astonished, for instance, to see that in spite of the, actually, the real uh, effective threat that terrorism represents for the United States, we did not have a security perimeter, not even the thought of it, in North America, it's kind of a, kind of impressive. I don't know whether that mindset is changing or not. You will be able to tell us, Everett, from the Washington standpoint. But I think that there's lots of issues, including now migration, the traditional drug trafficking, and uh, the environment that should be of common concern. 
and nothing of that is happening. What do you suggest, Luis, to spark this kind of uh, well, identity, as Everett called it? I mean, if, if you went to the White House and you saw the, uh, the aim tray on, in the Oval Office on the President's desk, you will see, I mean, a bunch of documents like this high, no? Uh, Mexico is just one of them. Uh, so if, if we want to, and so is Canada. If we want something important, Mexico and Canada have to make the proposals. They will not come from the U.S. And, and I think that uh, we always make the mistake of negotiating with ourselves and say, well, we cannot propose this because it's, because it's too ambitious. Well, I, I will have the, the opposite approach. Let's be highly ambitious and propose something that the U.S. will say no to. The U.S., if you ask people in 1990, will the U.S. ever sign a free trade agreement with Mexico? The answer would have been no. It's politically impossible. Well, 30 years later, we're still having the uh, USMCA. What would be the ambitious sort of proposal? Well, I mean, I mean, just I mean, listening to the previous panel, I mean, we have two things now that have political consensus in Washington, which is very rare. No, there is no issues in the in Washington where you have consensus. But there, there are two where consensus consensus exists. One is China; it's bipartisan, and the other one is migration. We have never seen the f migration flows that we're seeing today. So, if I was President López Obrador in San Francisco, I would tell President Biden, Mr. President. We have, I just met with uh, Xi Jinping, and I just came from Tijuana and I uh, saw all this uh, uh, Mexico being used as a platform to enter the US market. We need to do something ambitious. And let me give you some ideas. Idea number one, let, let's make NatBank a, a true binational bank, invite Canada also as, as a shareholder, and let NetBank fund all the uh, border crossing infrastructure on both sides, both sides of the border. Uh, on transportation, because NetBank can do only now uh, uh, environmental and wider things, they, they, they can do the transportation. And NetBank give NetBank a charter so that they can do also a border infrastructure in, in Mexico's southern border, border, because we need a lot of infrastructure to uh, improve crossing, legal crossing, and, and make illegal crossing a, a bit more difficult. Th that's idea number one. It's, it's a very important one, because, I mean, if near, for those of you that, I, I, I don't see people wearing the, uh, um, people say there is no NAFTA convergence. There is no single Mexican wearing uh, uh, earphones. Either they are doing something else, or they are, bil or they are bilingual. <laughs> No, probably it's the success of Harmon Hall. Well, but I, mean, I think it's quite interesting that you can have now meetings like this in, in English or in, in the U.S. You can also have a lot of meetings in Spanish now that it was impossible 30 years ago. So that, that's idea number one. I, idea number two is, listen, if you truly want to solve migration, we need to develop Mexico South and uh, Central America. And to develop Mexico South and Central America, the, the, what you have to do is to tap into the east coast of the U.S. Mexico has a 15.5% of the U.S. market, but from Texas to California, we have 23%. In the Midwest, we have 18%. And the east coast, from Florida to Virginia, 9 And from Maryland to Maine, 5 So where is growth going to come in the future? In the east coast. How do you go to the east coast through the Gulf of Mexico? So we need a, 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 to open a new border between Coatzacoalcos and Mobile, Alabama, make the Maya train a cargo train with some passenger runs every now and then, no? from Progreso to uh, San Petersburg, Florida, so that you can put Chiapas, Oaxaca, Guerrero, at 72 hours of New York City. I mean, uh, then you'll begin talking. Then you need to ask President Biden, listen, we want an exception to the Jones Act for the Gulf of Mexico. He will go ballistic. I cannot do that because the Teamsters will oppose it. Mr. President, you want to solve the migration problem? That's the way to do it, because we need a Mare Nostrum 
in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and for that we need uh, cabotage across all ports so that we have the best routes in the Gulf of Mexico. And we're not asking you to remove the uh, Jones Act for the world, only the Gulf of Mexico, and maybe the Great Lakes in yeah, For national Canada. security reasons, whatever, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> then, tell him, but I want something more, Mr. President. I want to propose a modification of the rules of origin for textiles and apparel. For Mexico, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Haiti, already has it through the uh, Haiti uh, initiative, in such a way that we can give the, uh, uh, the uh, people working in Chiapas and uh, in Oaxaca in apparel making, the best fabrics, the best threads, the best um, uh, implements that go in the, so that, so that they can excel. I mean, if the, I mean, we have tremendously good uh, um, people producing uh, apparel in, in, in Chiapas. With design, with, you need other things. Yeah. With the design and everything, but I mean, they don't have the access to the materials to, to, do, to be competitive. So if you want, you, you, uh, and why do you need all these countries at the same time? Because the only way to have near shoring uh, in, the, in light manufacturing, not only near shoring in, in high tech, that is mostly robotics, is in uh, textiles and apparel and, and the shoe industry. That's where jobs will happen. I mean, I, I, I was mentioned in the previous panel. I mean, you, will not, you are not going to have Tesla going to the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. But I mean, you can produce a lot of things in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec if we had a flexible rule of origin on textiles and apparel. Of course, North Carolina and South Carolina will oppose it, and a lot of people in Mexico will oppose it as well. But I mean, if, if you have some, somebody like López Obrador that really wants to develop Mexico South, this is an opportunity that, that to, to truly transform uh, and, well, and I have other ideas like that. I, I, I'm not saying that we should take 2026, as uh, Everett was saying, to reopen the agreement, because that will fail. But I mean, it's the other way around. You want to solve migration? There is a consensus. And, and you want <clears throat> to have a, a true nearshoring that is not limited only to high tech? Well, why don't we have a big initiative to do a light manufacturing in Mexico South and medical tourism. And for medical tourism, Mr. President, we need certifications, FDA, certifications of, of Mexico's hospitals, of medical that procedures, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, 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 and we need uh, universities to open up in, uh, in Acapulco, now Acapulco is destroyed. Well, why don't we have a large hospital center in Acapulco with a nursing a school and a medical school and a, a, a good hospital and then invite NYU to come to Mexico and do that in, in Acapulco. You, are, you, uh, are you serious about migration? I think that's the way to, to, to say it in the US and of course the answer you will get is no. The alternative is to, uh, to do nothing and I, and I think that the, if, if the probability of, uh, that they will accept is low but if we stay quiet is zero. Let's pretend just for a second that Everett is President Biden. Okay? I would, I would be sitting here, but yeah, we can... How would you, Mr. President, would react well, to what the President uh, of Mexico I, you I said? Will, I, I think, well, I think you'll say no. Uh, I think you'll say no. Uh, first off, there's no way you're going to get 72 hours to New York. We can't do that from Washington, D.C., so I think uh, that is a highly ambitious goal. But no, I love your vision, and I think it really validates the point that good ideas matter, and you've got to get good ideas on the table. Um, a lot of what you said does seem impossible, but it is not impossible. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, the NAFTA was... You know, you look back to the 80s, it would never have happened, never. But some bold leaders put it on the table and, and it, uh, the validity of it made sense and it, and it came to fruition over time. So I've always believed that when you got a big complicated problem like this, you need a good idea and the right political opportunity and then a team to execute. So the good idea is where you have to start. Those are some good ideas. Um, I would put another piece on the table in, if we were actually negotiating this, I'd say, okay, let's think about it, but here's something that we should also think about. How do we, how do we 
companies are so interested in mitigating risk, and one of the risk factors they have now is labor and environment exposure, which is not just a trade risk, it's a reputational risk. And it's becoming more of a legal risk in the United States because there's laws in place that haven't been in place for a long time. And companies work really hard to, you know, have their brands, they hate, they don't want to be in the wrong side of things. And then the climate objectives, if they're ever going to be met, the ambition has to go higher. And that means real steps have to be taken. So what I would suspect would be said in reaction to what you put on the table is, okay, well, let's talk about how do we ensure that those supply chains are going to be the highest labor and environment standards so that we can know that what we're building is going to be sustainable and be the next iteration of trade and not just going back a new version of the past because that's what we need. We need a real new vision of where to go in nearshoring. And where the political environment is now, and I think that labor and environment have to be part of that conversation. Uh, absolutely, Mr. President, and that's why <laughs> I mean, just moving, moving, moving production from China to North America will make a huge contribution to that process. Because in China, 60% uh, of the energy they use is coal, yeah. in spite of the fact that they are growing very fast in renewables. And in North America, we have tremendous potential. By the way, in the, the isthmus of Tehuantepec has the best wind in the world. Um, but I mean, the current government, of course, is uh, unwilling to develop that asset. But I mean, maybe other governments, in the context of uh, an agreement or such as this, will be willing to, to, to do something ambitious. And I mean, we want the best working conditions for Mexican workers working in Mexico South. And, uh, and uh, I mean, that's, but I mean, giving them the best uh, fabrics is part of improving their working standards. So yes, absolutely. I mean, but just moving from China to North America will make a huge contribution to that process. One area that, <clears throat> one area that has not been explored in the previous panels, and neither in this one, but I'm curious to know your thoughts about it, and has to do with a near shoring in services. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have been talking about mostly merchandise industry, transportation, that kind of thing. But how about near shoring in services? what Mexico's shot should be in order to get some of the services providers to come to Mexico. Yeah, I thought the idea about a, a visa for kind of a reverse visa where you could have highly skilled or necessary skilled individuals come down, maybe they'd be part of a training program was pretty, pretty innovative. Um, would you look at, and I, I agree to some extent, the textiles are definitely very, very heavy in job creation but you're competing with a lot of different areas for those. And I think where the, where the US is looking for new partners is in some of the more dual technology areas. So I think you need both. Mm -hmm. And on the dual technology side, that is anything related to national security, would it be AI, critical minerals, batteries, and we should talk about autos in that context. Um, you're going to need to have a, a, a nice, banking, uh, insurance, you've got to have the services sectors. The business services Absolutely. have to be there. So they either have to be produced in Mexico or you need to import them. And right now we don't have enough of either. But that's a huge area of opportunity also for Mexican services, isn't it? Yeah, and you could, it, and it's, it could be a temporary you know, uh, uh, process to build up the capacity to train those for the future. But without it, you just can't attract the investment. I mean, one of the first things that we would look at when I was in the private sector of where to put a, uh, a factory was, do we have the workforce? Can we get people we need? Because you don't want to build a factory. Sure, you need a road, you need electricity, you need all that, but you need people. You need people who can do the work. And you're competing with a lot of Asian economies that have a very highly educated population, many of them take many engineers. So. It's shrinking population. Yeah, it's shrinking, that's right, uh, which uh, is another opportunity. Which is a that's tremendous, I mean, I, I mean, services, should play a tremendous role. When people talk about nearshoring, all, all the focus is always, as ever, implying uh, on uh, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, nanotechnology, molecular biology, Automotive. programming, all those things we have to do. 100%. If we want to be serious about nearshoring, we have to do, uh, enter uh, the uh, competition for technological leadership. No? But, but it's not only that. Because, I mean, you can have people in Oaxaca 
specialized in uh, mezcal growing or uh, gastronomy or, whatever it is. or design of, for textiles and apparel or design for other issues that, 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 uh, that takes advantage of the tremendous creativity. M most of the Mex best mathematicians in Mexico are Mixtecos and Zapotecos. Huh? The Mixtecos and Zapotecos have tremendous mathematical abilities that if we develop when they're growing up, they will co become the best, pro I mean, the, some of the best programmers in the world come from the uh, Juchitan area in Mexico. Um, and, and, but I mean, it could be much more. And all those things are services. And then, of course, all the uh, architectural services, financial services, and medical services. I mean, North America has a, uh, a, uh, a scarcity of nurses. North America needs a million nurses for the next 10 years. I mean, what if we had a program? I mean, the governor of Huela was supposed to come, I think, no? What, what, what if we had a, 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 a university program in Puebla to, to train nurses? for North America, but in large numbers. So they have to be bilingual. No? And people will say, well, they'll go to the US at the beginning. Uh, by, by the way, nurses, they pay $85,000 a year in the US. So imagine a million Mexicans making $85,000. I mean, uh, and then of course, once you have that capacity, then you can de develop medical tourism in Mexico. And, and the other thing I would say, I mean, why don't we organize this same conference next time in La Condesa y La Roma, here, now in Mexico City. In the, the Sisters Republic of and, La Condesa? And, and there we'll have, uh, we'll need, the, in, in Condesa, we will need the translation the other way around, from Spanish to, to from English to Spanish. Exactly. Or, or no, from Spanish to English, because among, even the waiters speak English there. There's a lot of Americans now living in Mexico and working professionally on the services sector side. So this is a two-way street as something we had never seen before. Uh, and, 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 and I think, again, if we raise the level of ambition, I mean, why don't we have, I mean, we're talking about the, um, um, that the university program should be two-year, no? to train a lot of apprentices. No? Why don't we have an agreement with the US or with Texas and California so that Mexican workers can train in their community colleges? No? Be I mean, uh, let's do something that is ambitious, like something like that. And, and, and if you convince uh, people in Texas and California, they will, they will end up accepting it because the scarcity of labor is so deep in the U.S. that uh, the choices are either you partner with Mexico or you partner with people that are far different from what we are. Can we take uh, three quick questions? I, I have to go in uh, three minutes because I have to tape a TV program. Please, but I mean, uh, at least so you learn what the questions were about, yeah, yeah. <coughs> how much uh, people are against you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, Christy, over here. Where's the microphone, by the way? Or get my microphone. Can you pass it over? Well, over here. Christy Walton. Um, I have a question around pharmaceuticals and the medical industry because um, from the research that we've done on the supply chain of pharmaceuticals, still the majority of APIs come out of China. One of the issues with nearshoring um, and that is the quality of the product and the transparency around the pharmaceutical industry. And I think when we talk about um, medical services in, in any of our countries, it is that piece that, uh, that really needs to be uh, a, addressed. And I, I haven't really heard anything about that, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on it. That's a big, big gap also, yeah. Real quickly, over there. So you can learn the three questions. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, my question is, Luis uh, stated a, an ambitious plan. But what about the political willingness? I mean, right now, we are in the process uh, here in Mexico 
regarding the elections in the U.S. It's going to happen next year too. So let's put it on in a hypothetical way that it's happened. What will we need it to do about the political willingness to do it? Thank you. Okay, the third, please. Six. It's over there. Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, one, thank you all very much for the panel. Uh, fascinating conversation. Particularly, I love the concept of, you know, what kind of big proposal could come to an incoming uh, United States president. I may disagree a bit that the answer is no, because I think the question is, as we're hearing, you know, heading into the presidential election season in both countries, what would it take to get the next Mexican president to propose something like this, right? I mean, Luis, you're an experienced diplomat in this world. You know, was there ever in the last 25 years in your experience where y'all, you know, you did propose something that was, that, that was rejected out of hand, or maybe this is the moment now, because to your point, when I'm on Biden only meet once, uh, you know, in the fifth year, you know, more than once, but barely once in the fifth year of a six year term, there's not time to, to, to address so, something big, but maybe this is the moment with the incoming administration. What would it take to have a Scheinbaum or Sochil or, 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 or president propose something like this to the United States? Well, a good chat with President de la Calle. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I mean, I think the Aspen Institute can be a, a, a conduit for for something like this. But I mean, if if we if we write reports uh, uh, under the assumption for, of question number two, which is is politically very hard, then we we are we lower the level of ambition. The report, then report, nobody nobody reads them. Yeah. My my advice is, well, do we raise the level of ambition and see how far we get? I mean, maybe we will not get everything. But I mean, I think the two forces that exist now, China and migration, are sufficiently large in the US that maybe there will be a click. Now, on the, on the question on, uh, on uh, the safety and quality of medical uh, devices and, uh, and pharmaceuticals, uh, Mexico can do many things on its own with, without an agreement with the US. If we are serious about nearshoring, really serious, I mean, we need a COFEPRIS of excellence. COFEPRIS is at Mexico's FDA, so that we can develop the whole chain of uh, medical uh, services from, from the molecules to uh, hospitals, the whole thing. If we are serious about developing a modern agriculture, and Mexico wants to become the uh, kitchen of North America, we need a Senacica of excellence. Senacica is APHIS in the US. If we want to have to be a, a, a tourism uh, powerhouse as we are, then we need a, an, an excellent uh, civil aviation authority, an F FAA. No? And you go down the line. I mean, Mexico should be investing in these regu regulators and, and make them, uh, I mean, the, the state of the art. Not because it's the right thing to do, and, and that's what we should be doing legally, because it's in our own interest. I mean, if we want to develop these new technologies and, uh, and uh, participate in these new uh, value-added activities, then we need good regulators that will vouch for the quality of the things we do. Uh, and, and so Mexico, that, I mean, I think we need to put a lot of pressure on Claudia Sheinbaum on Sochil, on Samuel Garcia, and potentially other candidates, on the importance this thing has. And the advantage of all these uh, institutions is that they charge for their services. The same thing that uh, the NatBank thinks at the border, they will charge for using the bridges. So this is fi financially self-sustainable. Well, all these institutions, Senasica, um, uh, Cofepris, Aviación Civil, CNAM, all those charge for their services. So it, it's making this a budgetary excuse for not doing it is absolutely false. There's not a lack of money because they charge. With that, I have to go. You have to go, yes. OK, well, let's give a round of applause to our you. next president. He's a TV star. I will explain why is it that we have to do so good. Yeah, I mean, no, but, uh, well, is that, 
Luis had to go because he's well, a, a TV Well, that's star. great because now I can <laughs> tell you why Luis was wrong and he can't. No, he'll, 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 he'll get me on his show later, so I need to be careful. He has an actual show. But I, I just wanted to respond to the two questions, the third one and the second one. They're a little bit of the same. How do you get somebody to not say no? And then what, how do you, you know, what, what is the real political environment? I can't speak to the political environment in Mexico as the right time. But I do think there will, we're going to go, in the United States, we'll go through a very intense rhetorical debate heading into this election, and then it will be time to govern. There will be a transition team put in place, and when there's a document presented to the transition team, which I would recommend the Aspen Institute do this, and it has a bold idea, you don't need to get everybody to agree to it. You just have to get a passionate advocate. Maybe somebody from EPA or DOE says, you know, that's a, I, heard, I thought that was a great idea. It was a great idea. And maybe it doesn't come exactly the NAND Bank, but something like that. It was very, very interesting. So shooting high is, is the right way. And as I, just to repeat, good idea, right window, and execution can get it done. And I think there's a lot of good ideas coming out of this conference, which is great. Now talking about a really important topic, which how do you guarantee the security of a supply chain like in pharmaceuticals? That's a really brilliant question. And I think it goes a little bit back to what I was saying on labor and environment. How do you, how do you even ensure that your supply chains on labor and environment are, quote, clean. It's very hard because the world, you know, get inputs from all over the world. One thing that's really happened over time is an erosion of trust. People have lost trust in institutions, they've lost trust in business, they've lost trust in government. So we have to put in place new tools to regain that trust. I think supply chains is one where area we might be able to do it through artificial intelligence and the technology and developing programs that can actually do real tracing so you know where your inputs are coming from, where they're manufactured, how they're manufactured, getting kind of a certification. I think that's the way the world's gonna go. Um, because if I had a choice and I had to pay a little more for something and I knew it was what I, if I knew it was the right thing, I would pay it. And I think there's a lot of people in the world like that. So if, you know, you take the medical tourism question, if we were able to devise something like that, which we would need to work together in Mexico, and people had trust that the services were as good if not better, and that the medicine was as good if not better, that would be a huge selling point. So I, I thought it was a great question, and, and really goes to the heart of what maybe nearshoring will look like in a few years. So something to yeah, think. And perhaps, and perhaps following on in Christie's question, there are some other products, like organic products, for instance, or environmentally sustainable products, that could be the sort of the staple from an area or region of the world, and that's something we are not exploring. In terms of the NAD Bank, as you know, in Mexico we we'll call it we call it the Nada Bank. Nada Bank, right? So we should perhaps think of think the new name. Oh, we could call it the least, U.S. Canada. Okay. At least change. Yes. Yes. It makes whatever. Uh, Next use a, no, a bank or something yeah. like that, because the other one is not going to work. We can change the name. We can change the name, yeah. Well, I think it's time to take a break. Thank you very much. It's been tremendous. Thank, Thank you, Enrique. Thank you, Luis. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And one final, final word. Uh, we, have, we have a good idea of this exercise, as you know, is that we can produce a white paper to give it to the candidates to the presidency. Todo lo que resulte de hoy y otros ejercicios que haremos sobre esta materia, se los estaremos entregando probablemente en febrero del año próximo a los candidatos, candidatas a la presidencia. Creo que no tiene mucho caso con los candidatos, más bien con las candidatas. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Do we have time for the last question? Yes, please. Yes. Please, please, please. Thank you. So, Everett, I have a question. With geopolitical tensions on the rise with China and all the opportunities to come in Mexico, how does the National Economic Council see crafting policies to attract and support businesses shifting operations from China to Mexico? You know, it's a good question, and it's, it goes almost back to the very beginning of, the, of my remarks. Is that we're, we're at a very early process, and I've worked in the National Economic Council, so look at what's on their plate. There's a war in the Middle East, Ukraine, energy 
shortages. I mean, it's as someone pointed out, there's a lot of things on the on the. It's very very messy. So, um, but there are people who are tasked with finding these new opportunities. And so the National Economic Council will, as we go through this very volatile period, we will reach a point of semi-stability, at which point the new ideas will begin. To, people will start looking for, okay, we need a new framework. We can't just be reactive. We can't be tactical. We need to be strategic. We need a new framework. Who's got any, does anybody have any ideas? Well, Luis had an idea. Um, that's, when, that's when the action really starts to happen, is when you get those moments of opportunity that just open up and you don't know when they're coming. Um, and if you have the idea on the table, it can be picked up and carried forward. Um, the thing to remember, at least in our government in the United States, is that many of those people are overworked and they really like somebody to come in and tell them something they haven't heard and give them something that they can take to their boss and say, hey, this is a good idea. What do you think about this? Um, so don't, don't let it atrophy. Keep going at it. Keep putting the ideas out there, and the time will come when it will be time for action, and then you go and do it. So, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.